So welcome everybody. Very happy to welcome you to this webinar that's co-sponsored by the Toronto District School Board and by the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education. My name is Hilary Inwood and I'll be your facilitator for today. Um, I am the lead of Environmental and Sustainability Education at Boise. I'm very happy to welcome my colleagues from the TDSB's Eco Schools program uh, into the room today. Jen Vetter, Chris Metropolis, and Maddie Simpkins, who's working with them as a work study student. And we're very happy to welcome our colleague Pam Miller, who uh, was until very recently the instructional leader for Eco Schools and is now finding herself as a teacher in a grade eight virtual classroom. So we're always pleased to uh, have our colleagues new and old uh, as part of the session. Um, I'm also very happy to welcome our speaker, Jacqueline Scott. I'm gonna introduce Jacqueline in just a minute. Um, and uh, we're, we're thrilled to, this is part of a series we've been doing this fall on uh, eco-justice education. And I think this is a, a wonderful response in many ways to uh, the moment we find ourselves in society when we're having very deep discussions as a community about what um, equity and diversity looks like uh, in every field that we're involved in, and absolutely in environmental education as well. So if you haven't done the entrance poll yet, could we ask you to do that? We love knowing who's in the room and please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat room. We encourage you throughout today's session to give us your questions in the chat. We'll track them as we go and give them to our uh, keynote speaker as part of, um, of her talk. Uh, she's given us permission to interrupt her. So thank you very much, Jacqueline, uh, for that. Uh, so with that in mind, we're gonna move on to our land acknowledgement. Jacqueline asked if we could show this work by Phil uh, Cote, uh, Cote today, uh, who Phil's a, an amazing artist uh, and activist. He's a historian, he's a traditional wisdom keeper from Moose Deer Point First Nation. But he also has affiliations with the Shawnee, the Lakota, the Potawatomi, Ojibwe and Algonquin First Nations as well. He's a sun dancer, he's a pipe carrier and a sweat ceremony leader. Uh, he's recognized by Elder Vern Harper, uh, who's the Buffalo Chief uh, Floyd Looks for Buffalo Hand. Uh, and Phil received his indigenous name, which is, uh, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, to be fair, uh, Nujmoen. Uh, which means the healer. He received um, this name in 1979 from Joe Couture. He was made a member of the False Space Society at the Seneca Longhouse in 1992. Uh, we are very lucky in the GTA to have so many of Phil's murals uh, around um, our community as a, really as a point of learning for us. Um, so uh, with this in mind, this is his piece called The Original Family that he made in 2018 to 19. And if you are in the GTA, uh, you can go and find it uh, much better firsthand than it is uh, digitally reproduced, uh, located at Jarvis and Dundas in Toronto. So uh, as part of this, we'd like to acknowledge that we're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, uh, Métis and Inuit people across our land. And just a reminder that land acknowledgements are really the, uh, the just a, the reminder for us at the start of an event that we need to uh, work on an ongoing basis to learn more about Indigenous ways of knowing. Um, that we have so much, especially in the field of environmental education and sustainability, to, to learn um, from the original peoples on our land. And so we invite you to do that uh, as we go through today's session and future sessions as well. So with that in mind, I would like to introduce you, please, to our speaker for today. Um, we're very happy to welcome Jacqueline Scott uh, to be our webinar leader. Um, and uh, for this, Jacqueline is a PhD student uh, at my home institution of OISE at the Ontario Institute of Studies and Education. She's in the Social Justice Education Department, and her research focuses on how to make outdoor uh, recreation and environmental discourse more welcoming to Black people. We know that the field of environmental education has been very much a white space uh, since its inception, and this is um, one way that we are using to um, better understand how we can make it more inclusive and more diverse moving forward. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce you to Jacqueline Scott. Okay, can you hear me? Mm. Yes, and you can see me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So my presentation is called Black Outdoors, a race in the Canadian wilderness. And before I start off, I'd like to thank Elise and Dr. Inwood for inviting me um, to talk about the experiences here. So thank you very much. And um, slide number two, thank you. So um, today I'm gonna to talk about race, representation, diversity, social justice, and looking to the future. 
So I've organized a presentation in terms of a couple of tips around each one of those issues. And I am making sure that I focus on the Canadian version. There is much stuff along outdoor recreation that deals with the American market, but here I specifically want to focus on the Canadian experience. And that, of course, represents its own challenges. Next slide. An important thing to understand for me is that if you're going to understand the Black experience in outdoor recreation, um, the very first thing that you actually have to understand is the link between race and place or race and space. And in Canada, that means the, looking at the link between Indigenous land and Black history because it's impossible to understand Black history, the Black experience in Canada, without relating it back to Indigenous history, the Indigenous genocide, and this, the Indigenous dispossession of the land and everything else that flows from that. And having said that, my thesis is at the intersections of sometimes I think too many intersections. <laughs> so some of the key things that I'm looking at is outdoor recreation, social justice, Black geographies, Black history, political ecology, social nature, and environmental education. So it's drawing, reading and drawing a whole ton of references and inferences from across those fields because I meet where all of those intersect. And sometimes that makes a thesis really interesting and novel and innovative, and other times it makes it just a pain in the ass. <laughs> so I've got to be honest. You know? And the thesis was prompted by me trying to understand that in all the decades that I've done outdoor recreation, I do hiking, canoeing, skiing, as long as it's outdoors, I do it, snowshoeing. But the thing that's always puzzled me is that 90% of the time, sometimes 99% of the time, I'm the only black person in the group. And so I wanted to find out what is it about the association between outdoor recreation and black people that the two don't seem to meet. And the original prompt for my thesis was when I was actually thinking about Harriet Tubman and she's famous for leading 20 treks from the US to Canada via the Underground Railroad. Um, she's a champion of Black History Month. But what I really wanted to understand from a hiking perspective you know, how far did she hike each night? You're using 20 different routes. They didn't have GPS in those days. How did you find your way? And it's like, okay, you follow the North Star. I've tried hiking at night. It is terrifying. But here she is hiking in the night. How far? Where do you find food? She's using 20 different routes because there's a price tag on her head. So from a hiking perspective, she had phenomenal outdoor, recre outdoor skills, phenomenal window, um, wilderness skills, phenomenal survival skills. And so my original PhD idea was to retrace one of her routes to document that, but then quickly ran into the problem. And the feedback that I got was that a black woman in the woods in the US was probably not a good idea and especially as it looked like Donald Trump was about to be elected. And so pivot in terms of, okay, let's look at the Canadian experience. What does it mean to be black and in the outdoors in Canada? And sometimes in the presentation, I will refer to the US experience because in many ways, the US is the thick end of the wedge. Whatever happens in the US, Canada, we are at the very thin end of it, but the roots of the Black experience in both places are the same, i.e. it's grounded in slavery and its legacies, or in school, we use Sadia Hartman's term, the afterlife of slavery, or Christina Sharp's term, um, living in the wake of slavery. And those are the things that roots the Black experience in the outdoors. Okay, and in Toronto, one of the things that we talk about is the subway test. And that's when anywhere you go, you expect the people in the place or the space to pretty much look like what you'll see on the Toronto subway, i.e. a multicultural crowd, um, a whole range of um, accents, a whole range of skin tones. But that doesn't happen in outdoor recreation. And that's usually, that's a good test for saying that something is happening in that space 
And my research is looking at what's happening there. And it becomes important because in outdoor recreation or in the environmental sector in general, there's an issue around falling memberships. Um, visits prior to COVID, visits to the national and the provincial parks was falling. A lot of the outdoor clubs, whether it's the birding club, whether it's the conservation groups, they're also facing the issues of falling membership. And in order for those places to recruit fresh blood and younger blood, it means talking to the people who live in the cities. And in Toronto, that means talking to people of color, black and other people of color. But those are precisely the demographic, especially black people who are not showing up. And so it's looking, so my research has implications, not just for outdoor recreation, but for the entire environmental sector or environmentalism, as Carolyn Finney calls it in her book, Black Faces, White Spaces. And I'll refer to that book a little bit um, again. And the two pictures that I have up here, the first one is of Matthew da Costa, and he was on the Canada Post stamp. And he is the first recorded black person in Canada. He was here around about 1603. And the, um, so he was here with the first French explorers or French, um, yeah, French explorers who were the first to make contact with modern Canada. And the juxtaposition of the image is an organization called Paddle de Rouge. They had introductory days where they're teaching people how to canoe. And the thing that astonished me was a number of black and other people of color who were there. Because typically those groups are absent from outdoor events. And so Paddle de Rouge did something right to invite those groups there. And so I like the juxtaposition between a continuation of black people in canoes in Canada through 400 years of history. Okay, next. Um, the wilderness. One of the things I had to get my head around when I started school was what do we mean by the wilderness? Is it a natural space or is it a man-made space? And this is where the framework that I use, the political ecology comes in because political ecology and the social nature scholarships looks at what do we call things? How are these spaces created? And in terms of the wilderness, our ideas about nature, about the wilderness are social constructs. And what I mean by that is that the wilderness in many ways is a man-made phenomena. Yes, the trees, the birds, the rivers are real, but how we interpret them, it's very much a social construct. In terms of the wilderness, from a black perspective, the wilderness is seen as a white space and where there are few black faces and the ones who are there are seen as out of, out of place. Um, so one of the things that I look at in my research is about a cognitive map of the outdoors and how the cognitive map orientates you to what to expect and what not to expect. And in the black imagination, because of the dominance of the images that we see, the outdoors is associated as a thing that white people do in a white space where if I show up, I'm going to be unwelcome. And there's a perception as well from a black perspective that the unwelcomeness is grounded in the legacies of slavery and it's grounded also in fear. And the fear is not so much about bugs or bears or what do I wear. The fear is very much grounded in the fear of white violence. And that too has its legacies in slavery. And one of the things that I find challenging about the research is that I can find lots of stats that are based on the African-American experience. But in Canada, we don't collect race-based stats. And so sometimes, well, not sometimes, most of the time that makes it extremely difficult to pinpoint um, the Canadian version of the stats. Mm -hmm. And our aversion to stats has, it's almost like, well, if we don't talk about stats or race-based stats, then we can continue the idea that Canada is a multicultural, peaceful, loving society. And it means that we can look at race and see it very much as an African-American or an American phenomenon. And in some ways, it's a convenient ways of not dealing with our own race issues here. <laughs> 
but in my research, it presents its challenges in terms of just simply finding Canadian statistics. And the two images that I have up here, and I have to remember to speak to them. One is of Harriet Tubman, and the other one is of there are various black groups in Canada and the US who are leading hikes into the wilderness. And it's part of a larger attempt at reclaiming the wilderness as a black space. So in the Canadian version, you have Color the Trails out in Vancouver and you have Brown Girl Outdoor World in Toronto. And in the US, you have um, Girl Trek and Outdoor Afro. Next representation in the wilderness. So follow the instructions on the slide and take a few minutes and have a look. For those of you who have, um, have a look at a few things. Have a look at the Twitter feed for your organization, Twitter or any of your social media feed. And do a quick look in terms of how many people are presented in your feed and then count them in terms of how many are black and how many are white. If you have your textbooks or any of your teaching materials available, go through and do the same thing. And then we'll discuss it afterwards. But take a few minutes to do that. And Jacqueline, we had asked people as a reminder uh, when they resent, resent their link uh, for this webinar to bring a, a children's book. Um, as well. So if uh, you have your children's book with you, this would be a good time to review it um, as well for that, under this activity. Feel free to uh, share in the chat room what it is that you are finding as you review your social media feeds, um, your textbooks, uh, your children's books. Well, you're welcome to post what you found into the chat. And you can also, uh, I think if Elise can track it, we can probably take digital hands too, Elise, if you can keep an eye on the participants list for us. So Pam's got us off and the right one, Pam's holding up the book that she uh, has got, it's called Earth Hour. And uh, out of the 20 images, uh, only six of them are people of color in this book. Uh, we're having another person who's looking at the staff of COEO and all 11 staff appear to be white. Uh, Justin says, a uh, uh, colleague in primary loaned me a book called A Tree Can Be by Judy Nair. And representation is not too bad. Two students of color, both male and one white female. So you're right, uh, Justin, we could be looking at issues around gender uh, in relationship to this as well. My guess is, Jacqueline, that they're probably all going to be finding similar lack of representation diversity in the materials that they're uh, reviewing. Yes, and representation does matter because mm -hmm. if you don't see someone like yourself doing something, you're less likely to actually want to try it. And if you don't see Black people doing outdoors, um, outdoor environmental activities, then again, it reaff reaffirms the idea that Black people don't do it. That's a white thing. And um, how many of you are familiar with the, I was going to say earlier this year, though it seems like a couple centuries ago, <laughs> um, when they had the environmental conference and that infamous photograph that went around, how many of you are familiar with Greta Thunberg? I think in this crowd, you're going to hear a pretty high number of people who know, know who Greta is. Okay. Yeah. But what about Vanessa Nakate? Mm. So in the famous photograph of all the young climate activists, the one that went around the world, one person was cropped out of it. That was a black person, Vanessa. Wow. So, um, there, people are reporting their results in the chat and uh, finding very little um, really broad representation of people of color and Black people in their materials and their reviewing. Okay. And so the cropping out of Vanessa, again, it reinforces the image that the climate crisis, the environmental problems are white problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at first they said, well, um, they couldn't fit her photograph onto the screen, but really it was an issue around race. And as you look through your own websites, your brochures, your teaching materials, to what extent are black people, oh good. <laughs> Thank you, Elise. Elise just posted the link for us in the chat right. room. Okay. That photograph. Uh, it's about who is featured and who is not featured. 
And in one of my papers, I talk about a visual apartheid, um, not my term, but an interesting one, where that when you don't see black people in the images, when it's only white people, it does create that visual apartheid. It does say that in this outdoor space, it's a white space and black people are not wanted or not welcomed. Um, the absence speaks as much as the presence. And it does create a negative feedback loop because if you don't see black and other people of color in there, then what has it got to do with us? It's a white issue. And Jacqueline we, there um, from Chantelle in the chat room, uh, she's mentioned that uh, Wangari Matai uh, is uh, an exception to that. But not widely known. If yes. you're in the environmental field, yeah, but Greta has a reputation and a following that's outside of that environmental bubble. So, yeah. Okay, can I have the next slide? And on the slide I've put up, um, the image is of George Bonga. And he's an interesting character in that when you think of the fur trade in Canada, how many people think about black fur traders there were lots and lots of black fur traders. Um, very interested in black history, but where it intersects with outdoor recreation. And so I was surprised when I came across not just George Bonga, but also Pierre Bonga. There were three generations of black fur traders. And um, George was enslaved in Montreal. So People are familiar with Canada as a land of the Underground Railroad and Black History Month. That's the focus on that, especially in Harriet Tubman. But what about the 200 years of slavery in Canada that somehow tends to be overlooked? And George Bongo was enslaved in Montreal. Um, once he was freed, um, became part of the fur trade industry and part of their regular route was the canoe from Montreal, which was the economic heart of the fur trade and hence of colonial Canada, but he canoed from Montreal to Manitoba. And typically the fur traders would leave Montreal in May and they had a six week um, time frame to paddle up to North Bay because that's where the fur trade routes intersect and then paddle back down to Montreal before the freeze up. And George Bunga, he is sometimes referred to as black indigenous or Afro Ojibwe because his, his, no, that's Pierre, his son, George's wife was indigenous and his son Pierre um, was black Ojibwe, or sorry, Afro Ojibwe, black indigenous. And again, the second image of black people in the kayaks, though it should have been a canoe because kayaks are from up north in Canada. But again, it's a continuation of that history. And it's my way of saying that when you see black people in canoes, if you know the history, it shouldn't be a surprise. Because again, the continuation of the fur trade, 400 years of paddling the canoes up and down the rivers and the lakes of this country. Sorry, I'm trying not to be distracted by the chat. Okay, next no, slide. The good news is that the chat is it's actually quite active, which is great. People are sharing other stories they hear of, uh, of people who are black in, in nature. Uh, we have a, a link to George Bonda in the Canadian Encyclopedia. Um, so, you know, fantastic collection already of resources that are starting to appear. Okay, that's great. <laughs> so the next slide is on representation in the wilderness. And the, if you want to get more black people into the wilderness, into the echo schools, into the environmental activities, then you need to show them in those spaces in your teaching materials. It's as simple as that as a starting point. Um, and in this images, you have Matthew Henson and he was a North Pole explorer in 1909. People are probably more familiar with Commodore Perry but here's Matthew Henson, 1909. And there's something that I'm looking at um, about reclaiming winter as a black season, because there are so many reports of, or when I've been outdoors skiing or snowshoeing in terms of 
No, isn't it cold enough for you? And when you hear that expression, isn't it cold enough for you? The first time it's funny, the second, the third, the tenth time, there's something else that's happening there. And it's actually a conversation about race and about space, but without ever mentioning race. So it's a sense of, um, it's almost like, think of hockey in Canada. If you're an athlete, how come is it that black athletes are predominantly in track and field? Think of your Canadian summer Olympic teams. How many of those athletes are black? What about your winter Olympics? How many of those athletes there are black? And so there's something happening at the elite sports level where black youth are channeled into so-called summer sports, track and field, and white ones are channeled into so-called winter sports, i.e. hockey mm -hmm. and the bobsleigh. What's going on in that space? But that's an aside. It's something else that I'm interested in. But this is why I put those two images there in terms of these are Black people in the snow. And once again, Black people have been in Canada since the 1600. We have been through 400 years of winter. I think by now, we have a sense of how to survive the winter. So when yeah, we well, and I have to point out what Sylvia has said in the chat, that um, uh, when Black people are included, there are often white people who are showing, in air quotes, Black people how to be outdoors, which just further perpetuates the stereotype, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Or when we have the films such as Cool Runnings, the Jamaican bobsleigh team, mm -hmm. are people familiar with that? You know, oh no. <laughs> A remake of, <laughs> sorry, is that a remake of Cool Runnings? No, it's a remake of Call of the Wild, which is a Harrison Ford movie. Um, Nancy pointed out that the character Perot, who's a mailman, uh, uses sled dogs and the actor is Omer Sy in this case. So I'm assuming, it, um, Nancy, I'm sorry, I don't know the movie, is a, is a person of color or someone who's black, I'm assuming. Okay, so when yeah, I- think Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so when I think about cool runnings, it's the sense of the humor is based on a black person being out of place in the season and in the activities. Um, the fish out of water, but on some level it's funny and on other levels though, it's a confirmation of if you're black and you're in the outdoors and you're in winter, you are out of place. Mm -hmm. You are the whole point of the joke in the movie. So what message does that send to black kids in terms of the environment? It means once again, that if you're outdoors, it's a white space and you are out of place. Okay, next slide. Um, there are tons of parks within a two hour drive of Toronto. And in most of those provincial parks and the national park, Rouge Park, um, they're very close to the city and in Toronto, people of color are 50% of the population. How many of you have been to those parks and noticed the number of black people who are in the parks? So black people in the parks as visitors, that's one question. Think about among the staff that you've seen in those parks, whether it's provincial parks, the national parks or the conservation area, conservation areas, how many of the staff in there have been black? Those are excellent questions, Jacqueline. And I know we've got many outdoor educators with us in the room today, so they could probably speak to that in the chat, I guess. Okay, so Okay, so if they have the black stuff, what the black stuff hiding? Well, and so far we've got uh, one person who says that staff for memory is mainly young and white. Another who says that the staff at Algonquin, again, all white, uh, maybe some black families who are camping there. Uh, another person said they didn't see any at all, any black people. Um, and uh, from Christina, uh, goes to the Rouge often, rarely see black people, but see many who are Asian and South Asian. Okay. And so when I think of those park situation is to what extent are those parks playing the race card? In terms of the main criteria for hiring the staff seems to be 
you have to be white, white, and more white. And given that those parks, most of their visitors are coming from large cities like Toronto, how come there's such a huge disparity between what you see in Toronto and what you see in the parks? And Natasha says that she's already been doing this. She's a person of color herself and has been advocating for more uh, staff who are of color as well um, in outdoor uh, parks and spaces. Thank you, Natasha. And for some of those parks, they champion diversity quite rightly in terms of the number of women that are on staff. And I've seen that a lot in my treks around the various parks in the province. But how come 99% of those women are white? And Pam's pointed out that we often hire uh, those that fit, she's put that in air quotes, that just is it's about reconfirming our preconceived, uh, preconceived notions of, right? of who fits in these spaces. Yeah. And part of what I'm looking at is the way that race and gender intersect and how often in the park setting, diversity means hiring women, but specifically hiring white women. Mm -hmm. So the race is the first thing that gets dropped from that. Now, Martha Ann did make an observation that um, she saw a larger number um, of black families at the Rouge this summer. And I did a lot of cycling and I have to agree with that. I, I did see more people of color in natural spaces this summer than I have previously. So do you think there's been a change recently, Jacqueline? There has been a massive change thanks to COVID. I know the ravines of Toronto very well because I lead many hikes and bike rides through them. And this was the first summer that I was seeing so many black people and so many Muslims in the park. And so it's almost like the only benefit of COVID is perhaps the increased numbers of people of color who are in the outdoor spaces, simply because we're all tired of being indoors. Mm. And a challenge, um, and a challenge that it presents or the opportunity rather for the outdoor organizations is how do you capitalize on that? Or are they hoping that we will go away? And I should add just a little bit based on the chat that my research is very much focused on black people, not people of color, because I have another colleague who's doing that research and depending on your cultural or ethnic group, your orientation to the outdoors is very different. Um, so, for example, when you're in the parks, you will see large groups of Muslims um, having picnics. You will see very large groups of South Asians also having picnics. What you will rarely see is large group of Black people in the park doing anything at all. Mm. And also, in terms of my research, Black people in the outdoors face additional um, issues that other people of colors don't face. Typical example that when there are a large group of other people of color, um, let me rephrase that. From a black perspective, um, when you are alone or the only black in a white group, there's a sense of always being alone. But when you have large groups of black people, the racial radar is still on in terms of, is somebody gonna call the police? Mm. There's a level of anti-black um, racism that is very different from your typical um, flavor of the day, flavor of the day racism. I know that anecdotally that the Pan Am path, that it runs through several multicultural neighborhoods and some other research that I've been doing in those areas, um, the community leaders have said that the black um, youth will not go into the ravines, will not use a Pan Am path because they are tired of the police being called on them. So black by yourself, there's a fear of the comments are gonna come. Black in a group, there's a fear that somebody's gonna call the police. And Maha would agree with that, has made, made a comment in the chat that it always feels like she's being watched when she's in natural spaces. And I'm assuming Maha that you might be a person of color. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes, I, I am. Yeah. Yeah, and one research project that I'm doing up in Thorncliffe Park, there's a large um, and very diverse Muslim population. And one of the things that comes up in the focus groups for many of the Muslim um, the women, it's around that if I'm wearing my hijab, 
am I going to get the look? And so once again, for them, it's a sense of, yeah, you're, you're out of place. And Jackson's asked a great question, which is, you know, many of us have seen this trend of having more black people of color, indigenous people in natural spaces in urban environments, but how do we keep this going at the end of COVID? Great question, Jackson. <laughs> well, the first step is actually talking about race. It's actually recognizing that there is an issue. And for many organizations, there's a res resistance to talk about race. Um, the outdoor is supposedly a neutral space. There aren't any barbed wire there. It's supposed to be open to everyone, but that is actually not true. It's a space that's coded as a white space. And when black people or people of color who show up there, it's almost like you're polluting the space by your presence. Mm -hmm. And when black people show up in the outdoors, it triggers a conversation around race and about space and about black history and the legacies of slavery and how that shapes, um, shapes how we see the woods. Um, so Janice, Janice feels that this actually spills over into other aspects of environmental education. Um, Janice says, I'm a black educator who's not always found support for eco-leadership within my school. Um, yes, and part of my other research is showing that, um, well, outdoors recreation is a racialized hobby. Mm. Um, the environmental sector is highly racialized. In those areas, whites do it, blacks don't do it. Yet still, on the climate crisis, when they had the marches in Toronto earlier on, I went on those marches and the marches passed the subway test i.e. lots of black people, lots of indigenous people, lots of people of color. Yet still, when you look at the leadership of those organizations, when you look at the social media feed, the social, those feeds are not reflective of what is actually happening on the ground. Now, if your first point of engaging in the climate debates are around what you see on the social media or on the organization feeds, and those things are still presented as white people playing white savior, trying to save the planet, then again, it reinforces that visual apartheid, that black people are not wanted in the space, i.e. black people are not welcome in the space. Um, we've had a couple of interested stor interesting stories shared in the chat um, from Georgia. Um, uh, Georgia says that sometimes people who live in a particular area feel that they own, and that's put in air quotes, own their local parks and frown down on outsiders who come from other places to enjoy those parks. And Cordelia adds to that, that um, there's complaints of uh, when people are being loud in parks, it's, it's often attributed to, to black groups. It's somehow their, their fault, even when some of the noise comes from people who are white, which is interesting. Um, and the, the noise from the white folks often is determined as, as normal, but that from black people, it's seen as excessive. Yes. And there's other research which looks at the distribution of parks within Toronto and how those coincide with race. And I've just written something on race, on sorry, on trees, race and black history. And it's looking at the distribution of trees in the city and how it mocked um, maps onto race, i.e. the poorer an area, the more likely it is to be black and brown, and the less likely it is to have tree cover. And when tree planting is being done, it is more likely to be done in white areas, and the more trees an area has, the higher the property values, the higher the number of birds and other wildlife that people see. Mm when you're in the poor black and brown areas, less trees, more concrete, that means less birds, less opportunities to engage with basic nature. So if an area is bad for birds and wildlife because it's um, environmentally poor, it's also bad for people. Mm -hmm. Yet still it's in those areas that you will find the racial divide. And, um, so even something as seemingly neutral as tree cover actually has a racial component to it. It maps onto the racial inequalities in the cities. 
Well, and Elise just posted up the link to, to um, the situation that happened with Christian Cooper, who was a black man in Central Park in New York City, um, who got a police called on him because he was birding, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which was a, a shocking one for many of us, uh, its situation. Um, so um, Monica uh, says that um, she's been hiking and camping in Algonquin and there have been more people of color um, than what she has seen in the past. So she sees something's starting to shift a little bit. Um, and uh, Natasha says that as a person of color from South Africa, that there are similarities with uh, uh, how the outdoors in South Africa has historically been a, a space for whites and has, has really greatly changed over the years. Okay, next slide. Okay, going back to outdoor recreation and the Christian Cooper. Um, Christian Cooper hit a nerve and that nerve led to the formation of Black Birders Week and it's one of the hashtags there. And Black Birders Week was an, att was an attempt to address the racism in bird watching and by extension, the rest of the outdoor recreational field as well as environmental education. And what it did was bring a whole ton of Black Birders together using that hashtags. And I was involved in it from the Canadian angle and we were surprised at how many of us there were. And so in some ways we're using social media to go from what Lipsitz call um, segregation into congregation, i.e. instead of being alone and each person feeling that, oh, there's nobody else like me, through social media, we're actually connecting. And the Christian Cooper incident was, um, Breonna Taylor died. George Floyd died, Christian Cooper did not, but he could very easily have died if the police had arrived. And so it underlines the message that even when black people and the outdoors, we're not safe even there. And so when we have the conversations, especially about nature deficit disorder, about the need to reconnect, um, for people to connect to nature, race plays a, com race has a role in that. And if you're black, to say, well, go for a walk in the woods, that has a very different meaning than if you're white. And we don't have those conversations enough about how race and space interact. But because of Christian Cooper, we had the Black Birders Week, we had the Black in Nature, the Black AF in STEM, all of these hashtags are about Black people finding each other and having the discussions around what does it mean when um, the Black ecologist, the Black mammologist, um, and I show up in the field. And it has implications for the environmental education as well. Um, Allison's pointed out in the chat that, you know, it's not like black people don't have long traditions of being outside, that people who have grown up in the Caribbean and African countries have very long, like part of their, part of their culture and part of their family life is to be outside. Um, and so this is a, a different thing that happens. Um, and I'm quoting Allison, when people immigrate to Canada and the role of which outdoor activities um, they should participate in, like what's seen as appropriate for them, right? Um, in this case. Pam also points out that um, environmental racism extends beyond tree cover uh, into uh, air pollution and heat islands that we can see on uh, different types of mapping devices as well. Yes, very much so. And um, again, part of another research that I'm doing where someone from Kenya talks about, you know, she goes on safari the whole time. She's perfectly at ease in the outdoors because people look like her. When she comes to Canada, even though the ravine is literally five minutes from her doorstep, she will not go down there because people do not look like her and she's worried about the look. And Virginia, in fact, would uh, confirm that. Uh, she shared a story about her children having grown up in uh, along the Humber River in Rexdale and that her um, her husband is black and that our, while her children grew up hanging out at the Humber, her 14 year old son won't go there anymore because he's always getting, I think, the look and, and questions sometimes from police officers as well. Yes, <laughs> welcome to the black experience in the outdoors Canadian version. Okay, next slide, please. Um, okay, so to get Black people into the outdoors, um, the first thing obviously is to start having a conversation around race. And in terms of the Black community, one of the most effective strategies is to link social justice to environmental issues. 
um, you have to include the social justice component in terms of starting from where people are at, what are the issues that they face, and then link that to nature. And for quite a few outdoor organizations on their social media feeds, they have lots of plants and lots of animals and lots of beautiful landscapes about people. But from a black perspective, those plants, those animals, those empty landscapes are actually seen as a white space. It becomes another coded way of, oh, this is a space for white people. People like me are not welcome there. Um, and um, to the magazine article is that outside one of the premier outdoor magazine, um, the cover with the black person is their recognition that if the outdoor sector wants to thrive, they actually have to embrace diversity because the younger demographic are black and other people of color. They are the ones who will carry the organizations forward. This is the face of the outdoors. And then the other article is something that I was interviewed for, and it's very much around why is it in Canada, the outdoor is marketed as a white space, is seen as a white space where black people are not wanted, not welcome. And my research is looking at how do you break that narrative? Because black people are there, we are interested, but the numerous barriers that we face and the barriers are not around, oh, you can't afford it, it's too far, you don't have the right equipment, you don't have the right skills. Those are genuine barriers, so let me rephrase that. Those are genuine barriers, but the biggest barrier is in terms of race, in terms of social justice. And until outdoor organizers, outdoor education, um, environmental education look at those issues, that's the only way you can change that's the only way that things will change. You have to link outdoor education, environmental education to social justice. Okay, and the next slide. Ooh, is that the last one? Okay, so yeah. that's, um, so maybe we have more times, um, more time for the Q and A. So those are some of the um, articles that I've written on swimming while black and why swimming is also a racialized um, activity. And there's a reason why is it um, black people drown at, I think it's three or five times the rate of white people. And it's not because our backsides are so big that they drag us down or because our muscles twitch at the wrong speed. Um, it's much more around where are your swimming pools? Access to pools. No access means you don't learn to swim. Uh, and a number of, pe number of people in the chat, um, Jacqueline, have pointed out the connections with uh, Black communities and also the link to, um, to SES, to socioeconomic status as well that there are uh, challenges uh, there for sure. And um, you know, Jen has, has mentioned that with the TDSB Eco Schools, that they've been using the Learning Opportunities Index as uh, part of the criteria for where trees get planted, that they actually get to those under-resourced uh, neighborhoods and communities, which is great. Um, but you know, we know that there's links between COVID and how hard it's hitting and um, marginalized communities. And, and that that's another whole challenge that we've got to deal with now as well. Okay, and the one thing that I would say that in the literature, um, a lot of the time it refers to the socioeconomic conditions um, and those are real, but too often that phrase become a code word for not talking about race. Fair enough. Uh, Justin's asked a question. Um, he's wondered that in our role as educators, uh, how can we help improve the situation? Um, he, he's asked about exposure, about affirmation of interests, uh, and, and what you might recommend. From the, the studies that I'm looking at, um, the easiest, no, not easiest, one of the most effective ways of engaging Black people or people of color in the outdoors is to talk about history. For Black people, that means talking about Black history. So in Black History Month, um, reconfigure Harriet Tubman as an outdoor leader. Think of the amazing amount of wilderness skills that she had in order to do those treks. And by appealing to black history, it locates us in this land that we share this indigenous land that we're visitors here 
And if we have a history here and you can demonstrate that history, it makes it much easier to make the leap that if they did it then, then I can still do it now. If you have a question for Jacqueline, could you please pop it into the chat? We've got a few minutes left in our hour together today to, uh, to really ask her some of these important questions. And Jacqueline, it's just, I think many people have recognized in the chat that it's so important to have these conversations and we really appreciate you bringing the conversations to the forefront in, the, in a really open way, so thank you. Um, Sarah Jane says it's important for educators in schools that are not in low uh, LOI, Learning Opportunities Index, situations or racialized neighborhoods to be active and be aware of these connections between racism and environmentalism. You're absolutely right, Sarah Jane, about that. Do you wanna comment on that one, Jacqueline? Um, absolutely, that race, um, for black people, we are interested in the outdoors because there is no planet B. At the end of the day, for all the environmental crisis that we're facing, one, it's generated by North Americans and Europeans who are, if I remember correctly, 20% of the world's population, but consume 80% of the world's resources. Therefore, it's the overconsumption of resources, which is one of the drivers of the climate crisis. But the race is taken out of that equation. And Black people are interested and want to be there because we know that we're the ones who feel the brunt of the climate crisis the most. So for all of those people, when I think of the European context, for all those people trying to cross the Mediterranean in those leaky boats, when your choice is stay and die or move and you may live, you're gonna move. For all those from Central and South America trying to come up to the US, when your choice is stay and you will die because of the increasing drought, because of the pollution of the rivers, because of the burning of the Amazon, stay and die or move, you will move. Mm. Um, when I think of the increased hurricanes that are hitting the Caribbeans or the cyclone that's happening in the Pacific Islands where the islands are drowning because of the increasing sea levels, all of those are elements of the climate crisis, but the people who are currently most affected are the black and brown people. So we have experience of the climate crisis. It's not something that's, oh, it's a phrase out there. Whether us or our relatives back home, we have experience of it. But in terms of the climate crisis debates, the environmental debates, it's the black and brown people who are missing. But we are interested, we want a seat at the table to have those discussions because we know that there is no planet B. Mm -hmm. We know, um, and Mar uh, Marion's pointed out too that racism hurts everybody. This is not just about hurting. I'm putting that in black in air quotes. Uh, hurting uh, people of color or people who are black, it it hurts everybody because it puts limits um, on the work that we do together, right? Which you just alluded to. Um, yeah. And we've got, oh, we've got lots of comments flying in the chat. Um, question from Jan Vetter from Eco Schools. I attended a webinar last week on Dr. Kendi's work and the speaker said that we should be using the term oppressed communities, not underprivileged. And just uh, what's the thinking um, that underprivileged makes us white people feel better, but really it's not the most accurate term for these communities. Uh, do you wanna to speak to this? Um, terminology is very important. So whenever I think of Black History Month, it's like, um, why does Black History Month focus, over focus on the Underground Railroad as opposed to the 200 years of Black and Indigenous slavery in Canada? It's because it makes white people look good. And so many times if we continue to focus the discussion on making white people look good, then that way, um, what's it called? The white fragility or the white moves to innocence, then that way we don't ever have to tackle the structural racism just like how there's been a recent uptick in unconscious bias training. And it locates racism in the individual. It's because of unconscious bias that certain people get hired and certain people don't get hired. But if it's only located in the individual, it means that you don't ever have to tackle the structural issues, the structural barriers, the structural racism. And Taylor's question sort of, I think, in some ways relates to that. Um, Taylor uh, says that much of the literature, the research literature on nature-based learning, for example, positions nature as a way to fix black and other radicalized students um, who are seen as somehow deficient and lacking um, in terms of the, you know, in terms of academic achievement. So the question is, how can we move past this deficit framework to allow black students authentic experiences with nature without reinforcing the 
the, and she said gapification uh, that is so often seen in nature-based and outdoor ed. Again, it, for black um, students, it's appealing to black history. Um, from uh, different Jackson, we've had two Jacksons back to back in the chat room. Um, uh, there, they said the research that uh, that this Taylor is conducting in the MT program is around how we can increase the number of students getting outdoors more often, and so recognizing that the entire mission is nature inclusivity in a sense. And does anybody have some great resources to share on this topic? So, can you give us some of your favorite resources, Jacqueline? Um, two critical ones. First one is Carolyn Finney, Black Faces, White Spaces, um, Reimagining the African-American Experience to the Outdoors, I think is the subtitle. And that one really frames the complex um, history of Black people and the outdoors. And yes, it's American based, but her key concepts um, apply right here because she is speaking about the broader Black diaspora community and our experience in the diaspora, our experience of the outdoors is rooted in slavery and its afterlife. That's one. There's Dr. Um, Dr. Fikile Numalo, um, Decolonizing Place in Early Childhood Education. And that one specifically talks about how nature, the outdoors and place are currently taught in um, early childhood education and the racializations behind that. So that's a good one. And she also talks about the intersection of Blackness, outdoors, and indigeneity. Thank you so, very much. If other people in the room have suggestions for resources, can I encourage you to put them in the chat? We will capture those along with Jacqueline's suggestions and share them with everybody um, as a resource list at the end of this webinar. I'm sensitive that we've made you work hard, Jacqueline. Uh, you've been at it for an hour, and we do try to keep these webinars to an hour. So at this point, can I uh, ask everybody to join me in thanking you for a wonderful webinar today? This has just been uh, an eye-opener for myself personally, and um, I think incredibly informative for all of us. And I think we we really like to know more about your research as it develops. I think we'll have to have you back for a future webinar to uh, to track more about that.